uh, His Excellency Chief So. Okay, give me yeah. one second. I have one more person to bring in. It is fine, it is fine. Uh, thank you, thank you, Brad. I, I have a big uh, problem in locking in uh, the, the meeting, but uh, I, I can get in now, it's fine. Okay, any uh, uh, question, any uh, clarification, we will uh, convert to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Hello, can you all hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Yeah, again, thank you and uh, good morning to you. Uh, so today, this morning, we're gonna talk about, uh, let me get the right screen up here. Is not there, Brent. What happened to my PowerPoint? There he is. So where is it at on here though? Here we go. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes. Okay. All right. So uh, what we're going to talk about tonight is temperature and gravity and how it leads up to tank gauging. Um, and so the most important thing in, in volumetric measurement in tank gauging is the temperature and the gravity uh, to even begin to determine what the net volume is. And so temperature has an effect on gravity. And therefore, any change in temperature changes the physical level in a tank. And so, for example, a 60 degree, can you see my pointer? Yes. Okay, 60 degree tank would hold a level of, let's say X. And then as we heat that liquid up or the sun heats it up or the ambient temperature heats it up, the physical volume will rise. All right, so therefore we need to bring that volume back to 60. And, and inversely, if the temperature cools, the volume physically, the level will physically shrink. And therefore we need to, to also adjust that back to 60. So our standard is 60 degrees. Okay, temperature has no effect on mass. So if we go back to the, Sorry about that. If we go back to the previous slide. You'll notice that the mass of the volume does not change, no matter what it does in the tank. You all right over there? Good. Okay. He was echoing. Sorry. Temperature does affect volumetric measurement, and very much so. And we'll demonstrate that through the, through the training here tonight. So first off, before we get started on just exactly how to arrive at a net volume, or at least arrive at a corrected gravity, we need to talk about thermometers for a minute. Number one, we only use certified thermometers. Uh, some metrology lab or some certifying agency needs to certify your thermometers. They have to be accurate. And there's many ways of uh, determining that. Uh, typically they're compared against a known reference temperature at, uh, at, uh, no, at a minimum of three, typically, sometimes five. And that comparison is made to the reference and you should get a certification sheet that tells you how close to the reference the actual thermometer was. And it'll give you some offsets in rare occasions. So you wanna watch that whenever you get a certification, make sure there's no offsets between the reference in the actual thermometer. And you'll see that on the report. Uh, I tried to find a copy of that, but I could not. And if I do find one in other trainings, I will take an opportunity to demonstrate what that looks like. So there's ASTM dictates the type of thermometers we have. And that is a total immersion type and a partial immersion type. 
a total immersion thermometer is a type that we would use in tank gauging. So we'll demonstrate that a little while, in a little while with the wood back cupcake assembly. That thermometer needs to be in that cupcake assembly and it's submerged down into the tank. And a partial immersion thermometer typically has a line or indicator on it, somewhere around four inches below the, above the tip to indicate its maximum insertion. And so we want to pay attention to exactly what kind of thermometer we're using when it comes to tank gauging. And so you'll see on the thermometer where it says total immersion, or you'll see where it says immersion to this line. And so what you'll see is a line on the thermometer if it's partial immersion type, or you'll see no line and it'll say on it total immersion. Now, also what you want to be sure of is that the mercury in that thermometer is not separated. This does happen. It happens uh, very infrequently, but it does happen. So before you use the thermometer, we want to make sure that your mercury is complete and unbroken. Okay. A lot of questions. A lot of times the thermometer is used incorrectly. And so you, I'll get asked a lot of times, can, can I use a partially immersion thermometer and a total immersion application? And a total immersion application is tank gauging and or vice versa. And the answer to that is no, it's not practical. If a total immersion thermometer is used at, at partial immersion depths or vice versa, inaccuracies will occur. I've seen these inaccuracies actually tested it myself anywhere from a half a degree to five degrees. And that has a huge impact on gravity determination. It reduces errors to use the correct thermometer. So make sure we use the correct thermometer for which we are trying to determine a gravity and therefore the correction factor for that. So we need to know accurate temperature. We're good? Okay. So in, in tank gauging, we want to use a partial immersion mercury and glass thermometer. Okay, before each use, the assembly must be inspected and assured to ensure that the thermometer is intact and there is no separation of mercury column. That is important. That needs to be checked. I, and this equipment should be checked every time before it's used. So now let's, let's understand that if you break that thermometer, there's going to be free mercury flowing out of it. So take do not... Do not throw this uh, thermometer in the garbage can. Try to dispose of it properly. It is hazardous waste. And also one thing you want to be taking, take the time to, to uh, familiar yourself, your, familiarize yourself with is API chapter seven, temperature determination. There's a table in there for a number and locations of the temperature measurements to be taken in a tank. We'll demonstrate those in a few minutes. All right, density. Chapter 9.3, density determination, API, thermal hydrometer method. Why do we use that? We use that for custody transfer, and we only use certified thermometers, I mean hydrometers. So let's make sure they're certified. Again, they need to be traceable to a metrology lab or a certified agency so that the gravity that's read on the thermal hydrometer is correct. And it is certified to be correct. What is a thermal hydrometer? Getting on, uh, uh, Brian asked, what is a thermal hydrometer? I'll get to that in just a second. So let's talk about gravity. Again, API 9.3 documents the proper procedures for determining observed gravity and API gravity. The purpose of the procedure is to provide, it, provide employees to provide the employees with the standard, consistent, rapid, and safe methods of determining the gravity or density of a petroleum product. The procedures also serve as a guide for the interconversion of one form of gravity measurement to another, API versus relative. And so all that is discussed in the standard. There's a lot of information there about how to determine gravity using hydrometers or thermal hydrometers. So, now, what is API gravity? 
The API Institute determined that the gravity used for crude oil measurement should be based on API. It's an arbitrary scale. It's accepted across the industry as a standard. It's a measure of how heavy or light a petroleum liquid is compared to water. It's simply that. Products with the API gravity is greater than 10 or lighter than water and will flow into the surface, water surface, while gravities less than 10 will sink. So anything higher than 10 or less than 10 will affect the actual gravity being measured against the 10 of water. So everything is based on a 10 API gravity. It also measures how heavy the product is compared to water, and that is this baseline. What is the weight of the product compared to water? Why, do we, why is gravity so important? Accurate measurement of custody transfer and inventory volumes. Without gravity, we cannot establish a CTL correction factor for temperature of the liquid. And therefore that has to be determined for any volume inventories or custody transfer. So determination of volume correction factors is a primary use of gravity and temperature. Without those two, we cannot have a volume correction factor for the effects of temperature. Observe gravity. So simply put, this is an initial gravity region that you observe on the thermal hydrometer. And I'd like, again, I'll demonstrate the thermal hydrometer here in a minute. When gravity, when the performing gra gravity measurement, it will, it will be obvious that the gravity is X on the hydrometer. And then we have to convert that to API gravity 60 degrees. And from there, we determine the correction factor. And so we'll go through that process. Any questions so far? I'm going too fast? Okay, thermal hydrometer. It is weighted and it is certified. Uh, it uh, has a thermometer in it. It has a scale for both the temperature and the gravity reading. Uh, it is often referred to as simply a hydrometer. Uh, but this one you're looking at on the screen is a thermal hydrometer because it has a thermometer inside of it. And you can have these certified. I mentioned that already. And you want to make sure that these are certified to the right temperature or a correct temperature and a correct gravity. It's scaled in API. Let's see if I can, oh, this is the API scale and it only covers a specified range of gravity. And you can see on there, like, I think it starts at uh, 39 and goes to 50 API. 39, 39 to 50. Temperature, I can't quite read, but it uh, looks like it's going to a, a 10 degrees Fahrenheit to maybe a seven degrees, 70, 80 degrees. So it's, it's important to make sure you got the right range of temperature for your hydrometer of the crude oil you're fixing to measure and that it covers the right scale. And I'll probably repeat myself here again in a minute. Okay, so important notes concerning hydrometers. Purchase, again, only certified hydrometers or thermal hydrometers. The difference between a hydrometer and thermal hydrometer is a hydrometer, by definition, does not have, does not have a thermometer inside of it. Uh, therefore, you have to use an external thermometer to measure temperature of the liquid you're trying to determine the gravity of. Or a thermal hydrometer has an integral thermometer. Make sure you keep the traceable certification papers on file and available if they're, if they're requested. Before each use, inspect the hydrometer or thermal hydrometer to ensure the paper scale has not moved. Sometimes they'll move, they'll be glued inside that glass cylinder. And you'll notice if that glue is broken that it, in the glass cylinder, that the paper measurement scale could move. Make sure that the, that the thermometer liquid column is not separated. And if it's dropped or damaged, purchase a new one. Don't try to use a damaged hydrometer or thermohydrometer. 
because your readings will be inaccurate. So uh, typically they cover a range of 10 to 12. I've seen multiple different ranges, but the average is 12 degrees API from high to low. And you may have to have more than one API to cover your range of crude oil. Uh, typically three, maybe two, will be able to cover the range of crude oil you're shipping. So therefore you want to determine what that crude oil gravity is and have on hand the right certified hydrometer thermal hydrometer to measure that crude oil. You also, you're also gonna need a hydrometer cylinder. It's typically clear, it's glass or plastic, I would recommend glass. Plastic seems to become uh, you know, stained and gets dull looking, you can't really see through it. Uh, it may make sure that it's tall enough to handle your hydrometer. And so, You'll see in a minute how we utilize that depth to immerse our thermal hydrometer in to get a reading of gravity. Number one, you must obtain a representative sample of the crude oil to be analyzed. It must be representative and that's done by virtue of taking good samples and mixing them thoroughly. And we'll talk about some of that later on in sampling and in tank gauging. It's best practice to follow the to, to follow the, the uh, follow the following. <laughs> it's best practice to follow the general guidelines. Mix the sample thoroughly. Pour your sample to be tested into the clean hydrometer cylinder. Avoid splashing and the formation of bubbles. So this is a very slow process. You want to slowly pour, maybe tip the, the uh, cylinder uh, that's holding your sample and the test cylinder and pour them together, one into the other until you fill this, this uh, cylinder up about maybe three quarters full, somewhere in this area. And over time, you'll learn where to, what level you're looking for in this, because if you fill it too full, let's say up around this area, and you submerge the hydrometer in it, it's going to overflow. And therefore, your sample is no good. So you want to make sure you keep that level somewhere near to start. And if you need to add more level or take level out, you need to pour this out and refill it with a new sample, either higher or lower than what you need to be. Then you choose your hydrometer. It matches the expected gravity range of, which of the crude oil you're testing. We've already mentioned that, so just make sure that you have the range of gravities you're going to be tested uh, in your, with your hydrometers. Now, what we're gonna do is, I know this is a clear picture and I'm only using this for example. This crude oil is very light, but uh, what we do is, so you can see the, the example here of what that looks like. You'll notice that that level comes within almost uh, half an inch or so of the top of the hydrometer. And so the individual that filled this, the uh, test cylinder really did a good job of not putting too much or too little, got the thermal hydrometer floating where there's a lot of room above and below it. And then you want to gently stir uh, the, the sample by rising and lowering that thermal hydrometer so that all the bubbles come out and everything gets settled. And then you want it to sit for a while and note the temperature scale. Allow the thermal, the hydrometer to settle in temperature. Let it come to temperature. Don't, don't go, don't make, don't rush this process. Allow that temperature to stabilize in the liquid is submerged in. Temperature stabilization, just mentioned that is very important. When the temperature has stabilized and remained constant, will you take your reading? Now, one thing you want to do is make sure that this hydrometer is not kind of ha has any resistance against the glass of the cylinder. And so you want to kind of bounce it a little bit to make sure it's free and then let it come to rest. And let it come to rest. Look at your temperature again to make sure it's not changing. And then we're going to take a reading. 
After the thermometer has come to rest, read the gravity scale to the nearest one-tenth gravity. You see they're graduated. I know this is not a very good picture to demonstrate that, but there's graduations between each one of these. So one degree graduations, we want to read that to the, one, to the, to the nearest degree. So if we're above width, midway between 44 and 45, we want to read it to the nearest one, whether it's high or low, above 44 and a half. So we will round that off, in other words. And then we want to record the temperature. Uh oh, sorry about that. How do you go backwards on this thing? Left or right arrow. Left or right. So you want to record the temperature. Read the temperature to the nearest one degree Fahrenheit. And record those, you're gonna need them again. You're gonna need that information to calculate CTL and API gravity at 60. Okay. Once you've read the gravity and the te temperature, be sure to read the gravity at the surface of the liquid, not at the top of the meniscus, but at the surface. You'll see this rise looking through the, the cylinder, you'll see this rise of liquid clingage due to hydrometer. We wanna read it straight across for the liquid level. And by the way, all this needs to be level. The uh, table or the counter in which you're making this reading upon needs to be level, so therefore your liquid is level. If it's not level, the hydrometer will tilt and the liquid of course will be tilted. So you wanna make sure that this is uh, very level and that you take your time to read the meniscus right at that, that mark right there. You wanna read it straight across. Don't add, to for, don't add to it, read it straight across. And that's your API gravity. And of course, it'll be on the scale, so you can read the scale and determine what that is. Now, we're gonna use an example here. And so the observed gravity was determined to be 52.5 API. Okay. And then you got to observe temperature of 72.5. This is just an example. Uh, and what we do is, is we pull out table 5B, 5A, sorry. I could not find a 5A chart to demonstrate this. So table 5A is crude oils. This is generalized products, the example I'm using here, and I'm sorry but this is for refined products such as fuel oil and gasoline. So this would say table 5A, All right? Make sure it says table 5A, which is for generalized crude oils. And so you'd read that, and this is the same whether it's 5A table or 5B table, it doesn't matter, it's the same process. So you take your reading of 52.5 52 degrees API, you would find that on your chart here. Then you would look at the temperature of the hydrometer that was measured in the cylinder. And you would go to the temperature on the chart here. And you would cross-reference these two. And we've determined that the gravity at 60, the corrected gravity at 60 is 51.1 API. So we'll need that number to go to the next table to determine the CTL. So we wanna utilize this number here. Now, one thing you wanna do is I wanna mention before we move on, that there's other means of measuring API gravity. Uh, there's instruments out there that can be used to read it directly, uh, takes a hassle out of it, takes some of the man uh, interface that where mistakes could be made, reading the uh, meniscus, reading the temperature, these devices are available on the market and they are certifiable. So you'll make sure they're certified. And so you would also send it to a metrology lab or certifying agency to have it verified and checked. We find these start to be used quite frequently in the States and they're making their way into a lot of our measurements when it comes to tank gauging. And uh, they are very accurate. Of course, they need to be handled with kidney gloves uh, cleaned, uh, flushed out on a regular basis. But just to make you aware, there's other options out there available to you other than using a thermal hydrometer or a hydrometer.
So these are some of the uh, attributes of it. It's a held handheld electronic densitometer. It's approved for custody transfer for API. There's a lot of uh, 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 people using it for inventory control and custody transfer. Uh, it does read the gra gravity corrected at 60. And so there's no reason to make any no reason to make any conversions. Once you pull the sample into the unit, it gives you the correct gravity at 60. And it is come the preferred method. Okay. So back to our little uh, chart. Remember, we had a a a, a, a corrected gravity at 51.51.1 degrees API. This is prop, this is necessary for proper accounting, custody transfer, et cetera. To correct our gravity, we lose lives these correction tables. And we've just done that a few minutes ago. And like I said, even though this says table 5B, because I could not get an example of 5A, the process is exactly the same. So are the, uh, any questions about that? Just make sure we're on table 5A. Okay, so let's calculate the net the tank net volume. <clears throat> Using table 5B, which is generalized product, generalized products and refined products and, and the correction for volume is 60 degrees Fahrenheit, we want to make sure we're using the right table as well. So it's 5A and 5B, all right? So once we know what the 60 degree gravity is, which is 51.1 degrees, we'll find the corresponding CTL. So find the AP gravity at 60, determine what that the observed gravity, the temperature as read in thermal hydrometer. And then remember that for us tank gauge, we have to know the temperature of the liquid in the tank. And so we'll come back to that. We'll, we'll, we'll review that during tank gauging. But what we're trying to define is the CTL correction factor for the temperature of the liquid in the tank. That's it for now. That's all I got for gravity. And we'll continue, we'll pick that up uh, on tank gauge and where to go from there to establish your CTO. Any questions? Sir, I just, uh, I, I just want to check the table 5B. Where can we get that? Is, is, is it from API or? Yeah. These are all API tables, chapter 11, API chapter 11, chapter mm -hmm. 11 dot one. And they're, okay. and they're corrected, uh, see 2004, API reviser tables, updated them. And so if you use generalized crude oil tables, make sure they're 2004. That's year, revision 2004. Okay. Anything older than that would be inaccurate. Hang on. Oh, this, 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 this uh, slide presentation, uh, we, can you share us after that? Yes, this is Brent. After, um, after we're done, we will uh, we'll post the slide presentations and also the, um, I believe David has something set up to, to put the slide presentations and also put the, um, the video once it's transcribed and we'll get that put up there for you, but, but absolutely. Um, as Henry was talking about density, one of the things I wanted to point out is that with density, uh, as we measure the density, we can use online densitometers and some meters have a characteristic of also being able to, to measure the density. What I'm showing here, and I believe David had shown this earlier last week was, this is a flow computer. Now the calculations that, that Henry has been doing manually are all algorithms that are built in typically to flow computers. So those algorithms, when we go in and we set up, uh, a, let's say a product for, uh, for a specific run, or in your case, coming off of the well into the production ship, if we're metering that and we have online densitometers, we're getting the flowing density, the observed density in this case, we're getting that unfactored observed density 
coming in. Because we also measure temperature and pressure with this device, we then take and we apply a calibration factor for the densitometer. So the densitometer gets calibrated and a factor is derived to determine its accuracy. After that, we apply this densitometer and it takes that factor, multiplies it by the density, and that comes up with our density corrected. We'll, we'll come up with a, a factor density. We'll then bring that to standard conditions. Now, uh, in some devices here in the US, they'll say that's the gravity at 60 degrees. Uh, a lot of the flow computers are also based for international. So depending on what the reference temperature that you're coming to, that's what reference temperature will go to. And that's, you're able to set that in the flow computer and ask what, what, uh, what reference temperature that you're gonna bring that to. So we bring it to 60 degrees. And then the next thing we do after we have brought it to reference temperature or standard, then we'll go ahead and look at it as what is it meter conditions. And that's where we come up with the meter density and then we use that to derive the corrections for the effects of temperature and pressure on the liquid. I bring this up and show it to you in this, this format because uh, something that, that ABB has done is they have developed an app for, uh, for Google uh, Android phones and also for uh, Apple phones. And David may have shown you this, but it's called flow expert and what i'm going to do is i'm just going to type in flow x p e r t and i'll get flow expert download and i'll go to the google play store first but basically this is a free app um and we'll see if it goes to the google play store or if i need to go to the app store but it's by abb and in that you will find all the aga api ASTM, GERG, GOST, and also the, uh, the AAPWS, all of those algorithms are in there. So you'll be able to go in and you'll be able to select API table five, and it will ask you what the density, your, your density that you've measured with your hydrometer, what your temperature is, what your pressure is, and it will do the calculations to tell you what your density is at reference conditions. Once you have that, then you apply the next table. And we call them tables because initially, as Henry showed, they were all printed out in, in these large books. And Henry has an example that I'll show here. Um, and you used to have to, when you did a, a calibration or when you did a, a density measurement, you would go and you would write down all of your readings, you would use your hydrometer, and then you would use a corresponding chart to then determine or table to determine what that density was. Now those tables, which were based on an algorithm, those algorithms are usually placed in a software or an app of some kind, and it will, uh, it will go ahead and, and do the calculations for you. API, when we refer a lot of times to these tables, in the API documents, the tables aren't listed. What's listed is the algorithm that's used to calculate these tables. And the tables, again, are, uh, Henry, your video's on, so you can, if you wanna hold that up. Um, those books are large books, and if you fan them over, that is table 5A that he was referring to, and it is just pages upon pages of looking at temperature, and looking at gravity, and then doing a correspondent lookup to see what your corrected temperature and gravity is. Because ultimately, we're trying to measure the product and do a correction back to a standard condition so we can trade it at that standard temperature that we, we need to trade at. So that's basically what Henry's been going over. But again, again please, please feel free, free to download, download this application, and you, you can, can mess around with the standards that are on it. And I will, uh, I will unshare and let Mr. James take back over. Okay, so uh, we're gonna share, hang on a second. Uh, I muted you.
You're unmuting me. You got to unmute you. I'm unmuted. Wait. Now I have to mute me. <laughs> Technology. Okay, what's the B for you? Okay, so before I share this presentation, I'm going to go in since I just got these books in this 5A I just demonstrated a while ago. I'm going to copy the correct pages and I'm going to paste them in this, the uh, PowerPoint presentation so that you will see table 5A and not table 5B in the example. And so therefore you'll be looking at correct uh, corrected uh, API gravity and the correct CTL and CPL. I just uh, ordered these and got them in and and so now I can utilize them in these uh, presentations, which I did not have access to these before. The ones I showed in the uh, presentation came from images from, uh, from Google when I just Googled them. And so I was fortunate enough to be able to find those and utilize those for the presentation. But I promise you, when you see the next presentation next, next time you'll see that they are the right table 5A and 5B for uh, crude oils. Uh, any questions about temperature or gravity? No? Okay. Uh, let's see. We want to go to, hang on. Let me give me a minute. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Uh, so, Brent, how you stop sharing this thing? You're not sharing it yet. I'm not sharing? Okay. Nope. So just All right. So give me a minute here. <clears throat> okay. Let me go back to. All right. So now we're going to continue on with uh, static measurement of atmospheric tanks. And so. I need to go back to the PowerPoint and share my screen. And can you see that? Yep. Okay. And so uh, my understanding is that the crude oil is going to be moved by ship. But uh, before we dive off into ship, tank measurement, I want to talk about atmospheric tanks, which is typically considered a shore tank uh, in this example I'm fixing to share with you. And so just to give us an introduction to tanks and uh, what, it, what it takes to gauge a tank and so on and so forth before we try to divvy, uh, divvy off into uh, ship volumetric uh, determination. And so, I'll take this a little slower than the last one. I probably was speaking too fast a little bit. But uh, static measurement typically means at rest. And so in this, this uh, slide pack, we're going to have an introduction to static measurement. We're going to talk about the industry standards, uh, physical properties of crude oil, uh, the types of tanks, tank gauging, and why. Uh, you're going to touch a little bit on tank calibration. Uh, the reason being is that uh, tank calibration is a very complicated process and is typically performed by third party contractors. Uh, we're gonna talk about tank gauging, of course, uh, gauging equipment, gauging methods being hand gauging and RMAC tank gauging, and the calculation tables. And so there's a lot to talk about here. So introduction. In this slide pack, we're going to deal with the uh, determination of volumes in an atmospheric tank. Those volumes are de defined as a total observed volume, TOV, that includes all of the liquids in the tank, water, everything, including the crude oil. What is the total volume of that tank? Then we're going to talk about the gross observed volume, which is a total volume less the free water. So we want to make sure we deduct any free water that is measurable in our tank. Then we're going to talk about adjusting that GOV to a gross standard volume where we actually do a temperature and a gravity correction 
arrive at a CTL and arrive at the gross standard volume. Now, that being that it, at that point, we can either go one of two routes. If we didn't take a flowing sample as we loaded the tank or the ship, where we actually grab a sample of the crude oil to try to determine how much water may have been entrained in that crude oil, we will then deduct that water and sediment amounts from our crude oil volumes. If we didn't have a sample as we was loading the ship or tank, then we, that would be our determinable net volume, net standard volume, less the free water. And so two ways either measure the water trained in the get, uh, cured oil as we're loading the vessel or tank by an automatic sampling system, or we just take the free water out and derive it a net volume based only on free water deduction. And so uh, I hope that makes sense. There's two ways to arrive at net standard volume. One extra step actually from the GSV. Okay, all these volumes are important. They must be determined to arrive at the net standard volume. So let's just do a little introduction to tank gauging. Uh, it's performed for custody transfer. Uh, it can be. It's not always used for custody transfer here in the States. We typically uh, prefer to use measured volumes through a meter for custody transfer. Uh, Tank gauging is a second option and uh, is typically less frequently used. Uh, tank gauges are formed to account for physical inventories as well. So if I'm a, sh if I'm a shipper of uh, crude oil, I want to make sure what my inventories are before I ship and what they are after I ship. So I understand how many barrels of crude oil I ship. And we call that physical inventories. Uh, tank gauging is done one of two ways. It's either manual gauging uh, using the inage method or the eulage method, uh, and then by sideline or automatic tank gauging. I want to note here that automatic tank gauging is typically not used in custody transfer. It's usually hand gauged for custody transfer. And so whether you use automatic tank gauging, uh, typically is stated in the contract, uh, if you go with automatic tank gauging, typically there's much more stringent verifications and calibration methodology applied to the automatic tank gauge. Okay. To accurately calculate the volumes in a tank, several things must be known. You got to have the tank tables. We have to have them to understand what volume per incremental value there is in every foot, inch, Tenth of an inch, we have to know those volumes. And that's determined by tank calibration. And like I said earlier, that is typically done by third party because it's a very strenuous process, uh, especially for tanks that are being used for custody transfer. Uh, we, have to have, we have to have the proper equipment. We have to have accurate tank gauging tape and the bob on the end of the tank cage. They are traceable. So again, these need to be certified by a metrology or certifying agency. And there is API standards that dictate how this is done. We need accurate thermometers. They also must be certified and traceable. And we need a sample thief. And we'll describe what that is in a few minutes. We need the volume correction tables that we just talked about a few minutes ago. We have to have a means of determining the amount of free water in the tank. So therefore, that is also a gauging process. And like I said earlier, if we captured a sample uh, of, it, of the water and trained water and sediment as we're loading the vessel or the tank, we'll need a sampler to do that. Okay, so industry standards. Uh, API has several industry standards pertaining to tank gauging. Um, the tank, uh, tank gauging for uh, petroleum and petroleum products is covered in 3.1a and level measurement of hydrocarbon stationary tanks by automatic tank gauging is in 3.1b. 
So there's two separate standards, one for manual gauging and one for automatic tank gauging. Just so happens that the automatic tank gauging standard utilizes a manual gauging standard for verification. So you need to be aware of that. Uh, also, there are several chapters, chapter 17 on marine measurement, uh, at least four. They cover a variety of topics and, and uh, methodologies for measuring volumes in a ship or vessel of any sort, ship going, ocean going vessel. So be aware that chapter 17 is gonna be your primary go-to source for marine measurement. Also some other standards, the temperature standard is API chapter seven. It gives strict details on how to determine temperature based, based on using mercury thermometers, um, basically liquid and glass thermometers. Uh, also electronic thermometers, we call PETs. Uh, so there's various methods inside those standards to describe and detail how to take temperature measurements. Probably one of the most uh, profound measurements you're gonna take is the temperature. They need to be accurate. Also, if we're gonna do standards, if we're gonna talk about standards when it comes to sampling, we're gonna have to have manual sampling standards. We have an automatic sampling standard and we have how to handle those samples after we capture them. And so 8.3, API chapter 8.3 is a very important standard that really covers how to mix them and handle them because if error is gonna come into play, it's gonna come into play when a man is involved. And so that process 8.3 is typically done by hand and could cause error. And I'll demonstrate that here in a few minutes. We already talked about density determination in chapter 9.3, thermal hydrometers. Uh, one I didn't list here is 9.1, which is hydrometers. Like I said, a thermal hydrometer has the temperature incorporated into the, uh, the uh, hydrometer and where a hydrometer does not. The only difference is one has temperature or reading in, in it, the other does not. There is two separate standards. I'm sorry for not mentioning that one here. Uh, physical properties, chapter 11, table 5A, 6A. Uh, we wanna to talk to you about the 2004 tables, that they're the ones that's used, nothing else. Also, there's a standard uh, chapter 12, one is calculations of static petroleum quantities, which is what details how to arrive at a net volume. And so those are important standards to understand. Okay, so uh, again, we want to reiterate that the table 5A is for generalized crude oils. And so we want to make sure that we cover that extensively when we're talking about determining net volume. Why tank gauge? Well, most times we need to know a, a physical, beginning physical, uh, volumes that's received by tank gauge, uh, the change in level, also volumes delivered based on a change in level and the ending physical and the difference between those volumes received and delivered, the beginning and ending physical is the volumes that's been transferred. And so for the purposes of custody transfer, we need to know these beginning physicals, the ending physical, the volumes that were received into the tank and the volumes that were delivered out of the tank. Uh, we've already kind of touched base on this a little bit because you transfer and inventory is the reason why we tank gauge. Also, it's used in calculating our thermal gain loss. Uh, if we have thermal activities, we want to know what our loss or gain is for the day. And uh, by using the beginning physical, our receipts minus our delivers, deliveries gives us a book inventory. Then we compare that book inventory to an ending physical. And that number, the ending physical minus the book inventory will give us a gain loss. And so if we were interested in tracking uh, terminals activities and where the uh, errors may be made, we want to do a gain loss analysis. Uh, typically uh, in refined products world, they're done on a daily basis. 
where in the crude oil wor world, they're done either every 15 or mid month in the end of month or beginning of the month, if, however way you view it. And so we would book those numbers and understand uh, or try to understand if we have major gain losses, uh, try to determine where those are taking place at. Okay, types of tanks. Uh, like I said, we're talking about short tanks now. So atmospheric tanks come in uh, different shapes and sizes and, and uh, construction. Uh, mostly, most of them in the States has internal floating roofs. Uh, for anything that's uh, refined product, so to speak. Typically, you may or may not find an internal floating roof when we're dealing with crude oils. Uh, typically, it, if you have an internal floating roof, deals with the uh, vapor pressure of the crude oil. If there's releasing uh, vapors, uh, sometimes we like to retain those vapors, keep everything in a liquid state, uh, have an internal floating roof. Also, there's coned roofs with internal floating roofs. Um, those are done to keep the rain out of the tanks, typically, and to mitigate some of the vaporing off of the tank. And then we have fixed roof tanks, where uh, there's no floating roof in them. They're just a tank uh, with inlet and outlet to the tank and with a place to gauge it. And uh, also in these floating roof tanks, there's always a way to drain the water. I don't mention that here, but uh, we wanna make sure that the floating roof has, doesn't have any water on it because that will affect the level of the crude oil in the tank. So any extra weight on that roof will throw your level off. So just some things to be aware of. A tank calibration, uh, like I said, there's a lot of, a lot of work goes into this. It's typically third party. Yeah, we'll go. We're going to go ahead and uh, let Henry grab a, a drink here, real quick, and, and use the restroom. We'll uh, we'll we'll convene back in about seven minutes, and uh, we'll start going over the uh, tank calibrations, and uh, we will see you back in a, a few minutes. Thank you.
on you. There we go. Hello? Got you. Okay. All right. Uh, everybody ready to go again? Okay. So tank calibrations. Again, we're talking about uh, uh, shore tanks, but uh, a ship goes through a lot of the same processes, probably a lot more detailed. And there's API standards that covers that as well, how to determine the volume in a ship. But for this discussion, we'll talk about the things that's needed to, to uh, calibrate, create these trapping tables uh, for a uh, shore tank. There's a, got, you know, there's lots of things we have to know. They're listed here on the screen. Uh, we need the vertical height, we need the circumference. We need the gauging height needs to be determined. Um, let's see if I can pick out some of these. Here's the gauging the thief for taking a sample. Um, there's other locations on these tanks that's developed to be able to get uh, the gauge read correctly and accurately. Uh, there's a bottom survey done. By uh, doing the bottom survey, you include the dead wood. Dead wood is what we refer to as any of the uh, protrusions into the tank that takes up volume in the tank. So all that area has to be calculated so as does not become part of a liquid volume in the tank. There's a head stress of the tank, uh, roof displacement, if there's a floating roof, this indicates a floating roof here. And so uh, we need to know what that weighs and how much it displaces a liquid that's in the tank based on the gravity of that liquid. Um, and so it would displace more or less based on the gravity. Uh, heavier gravity, it displaces less. The lighter the gravity, it displaces more. And so that's a calcul calculatable number that needs to be applied to your gauge. And we'll get to that in a few minutes. So a lot of, a lot of detail into determining the volume of a tank and much more detail goes into determining the volume of a vessel or ship. Uh, as you can see, this being round and uniform makes it uh, somewhat easier to determine the volume. Whereas in a ship, you have V holes, you got straight holes, you got keels, you got different compartments. There's so many things involved that makes determining the volume of a ship much more complicated. And so therefore, again, those processes are done by third party. So uh, with the tank calibration or strapping, you end up with either an any gauge, an any strapping table, a eulage gauge or a eulage strapping table, the volume in barrels and gallons, uh, decimal tables in feet or in tenths of a foot, tenths or hundredths of a foot, incremental fa factor sheet, which gives you every increment between one foot in one foot, uh, more than one reference gauge point or datum plate uh, for bottoms or water tables uh, would be developed from that. So we need to have a datum plate, which is the zero point of the gauge uh, to, compared to the reference uh, spot on top of the tank. Every tank has a reference gauge spot that is used to determine the actual depth of the product in the tank. Uh, that's, that uh, reference is always used to measure the volume in the tank. Uh, you get a schematic diagram of the tank, uh, dimensions, and the relating tank strappings. Uh, there's other documents that come with it as well. Uh, the field measurement strapping data used in the capacity table calculations. Uh, uh, I've seen this done. Detailed process. And uh, it's a process that not only uses computers, but it uses engineering as well to determine exactly all the detail that's inside of a tank. So we get to write volumes. One thing you wanna be right aware of is that every tank has a red line volume. That red line volume is a maximum fill for that tank. You cannot exceed that volume or you damage the tank or overfill the tank, which usually results in spills. Uh, that we have to avoid. 
uh, roof displacement. We talked about roof displacement a moment ago. There's a reference gravity for that roof displacement and it's used in the calculation. Uh, if a tank has a floating roof, the cal calibration tables must be checked to determine the gravity of the liquid in which the roof pressure was calculated. So you must know what that gravity was to determine what is the adjustment in level and the adjustment in volume based on that roof. Uh, a lot of times, I've seen many times where the roof correction is ignored. Uh, typically that's in facilities where inventory is only its priority, uh, where custody transfer is not taking place. Uh, if they, the roof correction must be applied for custody transfer. Now, I am not aware of any ships or barges for that matter that has a roof uh, correction or floating roof inside of it. And not saying that's the case, I'm just not aware of it. And so a roof correction probably would not pertain to a ship or vessel, uh, ocean going vessel. So the extent of that error depends on, you know, the calculated gravity which the table was uh, construed and or the gravity measurement itself. And so those two need to be accurate to get an accurate level in that tank. So uh, types of inage tank gauging. Uh, earlier we mentioned sideline. Typically there's a float that, that uh, sits on top of liquid level. Uh, this instrument down here is tape is, is simply no different than a gauging tape. Um, and it, once uh, the operator or the uh, technician reads that tape, he looks views to a little window here on the side of the uh, instrument and writes down the gauge reading and then reverts back to a strapping table to get the volume. Uh, over here's another example of uh, hand gauging. Uh, the inage type, of course, where we go all the way to the bottom of the tank. We measure the level on the tape here. And then from that level, using the strapping tables or from this reading, we use the strapping tables to determine the volume in the tank. And remember now, this is total observed volume. Okay, so then what we do is we may go back into the tank with a water bob, take a water cut on the tank, and then get our GOV, which is less free water. Uh, when it comes to custody transfer, only hand gauges is accepted. Uh, again, if there's any uh, use of an automatic tank gauge, uh, which has been known to happen, I have not seen it many times in my career, but uh, those gauges go through a much more rigorous calibration process, a verification process. Uh, they're, they're verified on a daily basis. Uh, makes you wonder why someone would want to use an automatic tank gauge because somebody's got to climb the tank and manually gauge a tank to do a verification against the tank, automatic tank gauge. And so uh, it adds a level of work, uh, manpower to the equation, uh, and therefore it's not used very often. Uh, side lines, uh, the, which was demonstrated in the, other one, in the other previous slide where you just read the gauge through a window uh, from the tape itself, it's not used. Well, no one uses those that I'm aware of for anything to do with custody transfer. Also, the hand lines, uh, sideline hand gauges uh, should be verified. I have NIST here. That's a U.S. Uh, certification metrology type lab. It's traceable. And uh, we do, we verify those at least once a month. I know that sounds re a little, uh, a little bit onerous, but we have a certified tape that we lay down beside the gauging tape and verify the two, and that the, that the gauging tape has not changed against the certified tape, uh, especially when it comes to custody transfer. Uh, typically, there's a, there's a level of agreement between the tape gauge reading in this era. Uh, quarter inch, in my opinion, may be too much for a sideline adjustment to be made. Uh, for purposes of just reading inventory, but must be made if we're doing custody transfer. And uh, sideline is, uh, I'm sorry, sideline is not used for custody transfer, but if that sideline is somehow or another deemed to be an automatic tank gauge, then those adjustments would be made. 
So be aware that uh, you want to try to stay away from any automated or sideline type, type gauging in custody transfer. Uh, again, the sideline is considered to be a mechanical type tank gauge, and some people classify those as automatic. So just be careful how people use the word sideline versus automatic tank gauge. They may be saying automatic, which, which uh, would lead one to believe it's a more sophisticated piece of equipment when it's really nothing more than a sideline gauge. So be aware of that. Uh, here's an example of automatic tank gauging. Uh, this particular model would uh, raise and lower a servo, a weight at the bottom it, when that senses the weight being lighter, that's the, that's the uh, level in the tank. And so the servo raises and lowers this, this plumb bob, I'll call it for lack of a better description, to determine what the level of the tank is. And it happens several times a day. It's actually programmable uh, as to how often it does that. Uh, typically when they're filling the tank caused due to turbulence, they'll raise the servo up all the way until, the, until about the red line height. Uh, that height might be somewhere, let's say in this area, they'll raise that up to that area as a warning that they're filling the tank, getting too close to overfill. And so it just depends on local operations, how they use these gauges. Okay. Automatic tank gauging. If it's used for custody transfer inventory purposes, I've already mentioned it must be verified and certified uh, to be able to be used. And I think what we're going to find that on a lot of ships, they use automatic tank gauging. And so we need to be aware of that and that those are verified on a regular basis. And it should be paperwork giving you that detail associated with that gauge. Typically, we want the temperature to be read. Then on the automatic tank gauge, sometimes provides temperature. And we want to make sure those are calibrated and verified with two tenths of a degree. So there's a process to do that as well. It's usually in the electronics. Uh, again, someone has to climb the tank and make that temperature measurement to verify it to the automatic tank gauge temperature measurement. And typically, you set an offset. Uh, so that it matches your measurement in the tank. Also automatic ATGs, automatic tank gauges must agree within two tenths or quarter inch, or it must be recalibrated. So once again, we climb the tank, we gauge it with a certified tape. We come back down, we read the gauge on the automatic tank gauging system, and it must be within these tolerances or it has to be recalibrated. And again, I want to restress that I have been in cases where I've been told many times it's automatic tank gauge only to get out there and find out it's really a mechanical sideline gauge. And we have been taking deliveries from that automatic tank gauge or supposed automatic tank gauge for quite some time. So uh, you want to be aware that mechanical tank gauges are not considered automatic tank gauges. All right, so every time we climb a tank, we have to take certain pieces of equipment with us to do that, to make these measurements in the tank. Uh, we want a gauge tape uh, with, a, with, a, with a bob on the end of it. It's usually weighted, of course. Uh, we want a thermometer. We want a sample thief. And we'll look at these in a minute. We want sample bottles. So we've got to pour that sample into these bottles. We want water cut indicating paste. And we may need, most times, petroleum indicating paste. So be aware that we need these pieces of equipment before we go up that tank. Uh, there's different types, of course, and one is a inch type and one is a eulage type. So we want to be aware of that as well. All right, so hand line taking, tank gauging. So the unit itself, the, the tape and the plumb bob must be uh, verified accurate as a unit. Uh, if you change this piece to a longer uh, plumb bob to a longer length, that changes the whole tape measurement. So be, make sure that you have a plumb bob 
that falls within the first reading of 10 inches. If you put a, let's say a 12 inch plumb bob on here, that first reading is gonna be incorrect. And I have found that in the past or they had the wrong length of plumb bob attached to the tape. So uh, these kind of things need to be verified and checked. It's an ongoing verification process. Um, the zero point is a very tip. And so once we fill that datum plate, this is the inage gauge we're talking about now, not outage gauges or ulage. We'll lower that down till we hit that datum plate. And we'll make sure we won't hit it too hard and lay that gauge over. Once we have our reference point, we'll make sure we lower that gauge down real slowly and hold the tape to the reference point, which is right here. And so we'll lower that tape gauge down until we hit that datum plate very lightly and know that we're sitting on the plate before we make the reading here and before we take the reading here as we pull the tape up. And so be aware that this process requires a little bit of detail, attention to detail. Okay, so eulage ga gauging, a totally different animal than inage gauging. Inage gauging is performed by the distance from the datum plate, which is the bottom of the tank. The datum plate is set by the tank manufacturer or construction during construction, and it is found in the, the strapping tables. So you'll know where the datum plate is and what level the datum plate is at. There's many, many times volume below the datum plate, but the tank strappings will demonstrate that. And so we measure that from the datum plate to the liquid surface at the reference point. So we make sure we hold that reference point at the same place every time on top of the tank. Now, on the other hand, outage eulage gauging, the distance from the liquid surface to the top of the tank reference point. And so it's a different measurement. We're only going into the top of the liquid, not going all the way down to the bottom of the tank, to the datum plate. So we want to make sure that, oh, sorry. Make sure that we understand the process of which we're performing where eulage is different from inage. Okay. So we want to collect that equipment again. We want to climb that tank with a thermometer, tank gauge, plumb bob, petroleum paste, or water cut paste, a sample thief, and all this. Don't forget the PPE. Make sure we're dressed properly for this. This is a hazardous process, uh, splash in your face, uh, spills. Um, there's a lot of uh, safety gear that needs to be considered here. So what we want to do is we'll make sure we have a couple of pair of rubberized or nitrile gloves. We definitely need rags. Yeah, don't waste time climbing a tank without our rags. Uh, sometimes we need a handheld radio so we can communicate with the, with the control room. Uh, we need solvent. We need bottles. We need bottles that the solvent is in to be able to squirt it and clean things off with. We usually have a clean bucket. Uh, for pouring our sample and make sure we, we don't drip anything on the tank. Or Also, we need to locks and tags and whatever is required by the local operations to deem that tank uh, safe and uh, that the volume is kept accurate with no one tampering with the volume uh, in any way. Okay, so when we get up there on top of that tank, we want to know the level of the product. We want to know where the water's at and how much water there is. We want to know the temperature and we want to know the density. So the only way to get that density is to grab a sample. And the only way that to know that temperature is to lower the thermometer down into the tank. And the only way to know that level is to be able to lower that, that tank strapping or that tank tape with a plumb bob down into the tank. To establish India established the level. Okay, so there's several steps. First thing you do is determine the volume in the tank or the ship. The second step is determine the temperature. 
The third step is to pull a sample. The fourth step is to take that sample and that temperature to determine the gravity at observed conditions. And then we want by the tank temperature, we want to correct that gravity to the tank at 60 degrees. By virtue of all that information, we can determine the net volume. So there's some, uh, some things, other words and definitions you need to be aware of when it comes to ships. I just listed a couple of them here. Uh, a few of them because there's a, a total different nomenclature when it comes with dealing with ships than when it comes to shore tanks. And so these are just, like I said, an example of those. You'll find all these definitions in chapter 17, API chapter 17, uh, along with all the details surrounding each one of these definitions. And so I just wanna make you aware that before you become comfortable with any marine type gauging level determination, volume determination, that time is spent understanding the standards. And so I chose these as because they're strange and they're barely ever used uh, on tank, uh, on shore tanks. And so based on these four, I could promise you there's a half a dozen more special words and vocabulary associated with marine vessels. Too many to go into the detail. But I use these as an example that you need to take the time to review the standards and understand the details associated with marine measurement. So before we can even begin to strap or measure a tank level in a ship or vessel, uh, it has to be trimmed. The stern to aft, port to starboard, it's, it should be as level as possible, uh, side to side and front to back. Uh, we all know that lo uh, loading ships in the open sea is uh, gonna be very complicated. It's, uh, it has to be done by trained professionals. Uh, a lot of times the average of these gauges are used based on the movement of the vessel. So there's so many things that needs to be uh, thought about, considered, uh, talked about, you know, even so far as to have meetings before these gauges are done to understand exactly what's going to take place, what is happening to the ship, how's the ship responding to the, the ocean itself. Uh, stand by a second. We had a question. Who did? Yeah, we oh, question. okay. They were asking normally, what is the weight of the plumb bob? Oh. And how can we ensure that the bob will go straight down vertically to the bottom of the tank? Okay, so um, the weight of the plumb bob is typically determined by its length. And so, of course, a 10 inch plumb bob, we can have, I've seen six, 10, and 12 inch plumb bobs. I've seen one 16 inch in my life, which was used for eulage uh, measurements. Uh, so it just depends on its length. It's all made of a, of a, a, a brass type material. Uh, so the weight varies. Based on the weight, because it is weighted, uh, the plumb, the tape go in the plumb bob goes straight down into the tank, with the exception of if the tank is being utilized, loaded into while you're trying to take a gauge, which causes a lot of swirl. And so therefore the tape is moving quite a bit. Uh, there's really, it's really not recommended to try to take a tank gauge reading while the tank is active. And so the tank needs to be settled, calm, and uh, so that it doesn't move your plumb bob around. You can actually miss the datum plate if it's moving so much. And you'll think you're on the datum plate, but you're actually on the bottom of the tank, which completely throws your tank measurement off. And so it's based, based, just basically based on the fact that it's heavy and that, and that it, it is capable of being moved around. So just because it's heavy doesn't mean it's not going to move. Uh, it should not move if the tank is stable and no turbulence in the tank. That's the only way I think I can answer it. Uh, I've never really measured the weight of the plumb bomb. Uh, I just know they're heavy. Uh, let's say on the order of a six inch being two pounds. So it's, uh, it's not light. So anyway, back to the, the ship. There's just so many things to be aware of. Um, 
if it's listing, you're going to get a different level than if it's not listing. There's going to be multiple places on each. Most of these, most ships, uh, tankers, I'll call it for lack of a better description, has multiple compartments. And so each compartment is going to need to be gauged. And so the first thing to determine is what's happening to that ship and how are we going to make these measurements as the ship is moving. And the standards cover that. There is so many mathematical computations based on the list, based on trim. Uh, of course, each ship has tables. Those strapping tables, when I say tables, I meant strapping tables, uh, has angles, plus or minus, degrees of angle with a varying amount of volume. And so if it's off two degrees, at a, at a certain measurement point, let's say like is right here, uh, you can read the table adjusted by the, uh, the amount of the list or the uh, trim. And so it is a very complicated and owner's task. And again, it needs to be done by trained professionals and it needs to be done by someone that understands the ship and everything associated with that ship. And so it is very complicated. That's all I can say with assurance. <laughs> uh, I've seen it done and it's, it's uh, not fun to do. So I want you to be aware of that. This is very critical that all the aspects of ship gauging is taken into consideration. Okay, so usage gauging. Uh, this is going to be a process, a procedure, just a very high level procedure. Uh, because we're lowering the plumb bob into the liquid level at the top of the level, the liquid level top, we we're not going to be able to stop it right at the very top. So that plumb bob is going to submerge into the liquid just a little bit. Once you determine, based on a couple of test gauges, test runs, where that level is sitting, based on using some type of cut paste, you would then mark the reference height against your tape. Then you would go back in for your measurements. So you lower the tape into the tank to the tip of the bob is just above the retained product and slowly lower that bob into the liquid, the crude oil. Let it sit there for a moment so that it actually performs a uh, color change to the paste. And that will be your level. And then you withdraw the uh, tape until you get the, to the plumb bob and you make that measurement. And we'll give an example of how that's done here in a few minutes uh, to take the uh, reference height, the height of the uh, reference point uh, based on the bottom of the tank, that height between the bottom and the reference point, where the level's at, and uh, make a, make a uh, based on the strappings, make a judgment as to what the volume is in that tank, All right? So here's some examples of eulage gauges. Like I said, uh, eulage process, we're lowering that block, bob and just into the liquid level. So we make sure we get a good cut. We leave it stable. Once we get into that liquid, leave it stable. So it makes a good cut on the plumb bob at its volume, at its mark. And then, Another example of that is here in a, in a, in a tank. Uh, so we need to know the reference gauge height. We need to know the total tape reading. That determines the height of the product. And so I, I have an example later on of how we calculate all this. Then the other thing we must do is we must determine the free water. And so another thing is we put water cut paste on there. We go down into the tank and we determine is there any free water in the tank based on hitting the bottom of the tank or the, or the datum plate. And so that will determine the amount of free water. But that is read directly off of the thump plumb bob and, and, and compared against the strapping table to determine the volume of the free water. And so that's another second process to determine the level of the liquid and then determine the water content, the free water content. And so here's an example. Uh, the tank reference height, and what I'm doing is I'm going to go back and forth between a couple of slides here. Uh oh, sorry. 
take river's height is that height right there in my, oh, oh sorry I'm trying to get my mouse to light up there you go that's the reference height right there at the top of that there's a mark typically on that hatch as a reference height so the reference height from the bottom of the tank to the top or from the reference height to the bottom of the tank is 55 feet The tape at reference point is 10 foot. So that means I've got my plumb bob in the liquid and I'm at 10 feet reading that tape at 10 feet at the reference point. The plumb bob reading comes back out of the tank at 1.25 inches. So I've got that into the liquid 1.25 inches. And so by doing the math, I come up with a gauge of 43 feet 0.125 inches. And so I have to do the subtraction of this 10 feet from the 55 plus to 1.25 inches to arrive at the gauge height of the liquid. Once I know that gauge height, while I'm up there, I'm also getting my gravity. And we're gonna use it in our example here. That's 52.5 degrees API. And we're gonna grab an observed temperature of 67 degrees of the liquid in the tank. Now there's some more details around how the gravity is determined in the, in the sample that's taken and the temperature and where it's taken at. We'll, we'll touch base on that in a minute. So our reference, we use our reference trapping tables. We have to determine the total volume in the tank, the usage calculation, and we have to determine the free water in the tank. And so remember, we go back in and we find out if there's any free water in that tank. Well, in our example here, we determined there's 1,234 barrels 0.23 barrels of water in that bottom of that tank. Uh, a lot of ships hold a water level, almost always hold a water level in the tank, and you must know what that is. And we use that same reference points for each one of those gauges, whether we're looking for the total volume, usage calculation, or we're looking for the free water. We use the same reference point. And so based on the 43 foot hypothetical table, um, I really couldn't find a uh, eulage table to use for my example. Um, so I'm just going to hypothetically study this 43 feet. And that volume comes out to be 107,774 barrels. OK, that's a total observed volume. So that's all the liquid, the crude oil, and the water. Now I'll go back in there and try to determine my water volume, how much that is. We determined that to be 1,234 barrels. 0.23 barrels, we subtract that free water from our TOV and we get our gross observed volume of 106,540 barrels, 0.18 barrels. And so now we have our GOV. And so any, any tape reading requirements in API requires that tanks over a thousand barrels, which is what we're dealing with here. You take three consecutive readings, must agree within 0.01 inches of eighth of an inch or point or two tenths or one tenth of an inch. And so you want to take that gauges, those gauge readings three times, especially on a ship, because you're going to average those three gauge readings together. We determine the temperature either using an electronic probe or a wood back thermometer, which we talked about in the other presentation, where we put it a immersion, uh, a partial immersion thermometer, a total immersion thermometer into this, uh, into this container, lower it down in the tank to grab the temperature and read it manually. Whereas with these devices, we're reading them electronically. And although these are electronic devices, they also must be certified and verified on a regular basis. You cannot, cannot take it for granted that the temperature is not shifted on these devices. So always verify and have certified annually minimum. The wood back is, is simply a place to capture the liquid in this little cup here and hold it there while you prove it, pull it to the top of the tank. So you can then tilt it and make a reading 
of the temperature in the tank. And so you might want to do that at different locations depending on the level in the tank, and then we'll discuss that in a minute. And so we talked about the thermometers a while ago. And so this, this slide is here just as a reminder that, uh, that we want to use a total immersion type thermometer in a wood back, taking the temperature of the tank if it's a glass thermometer. Otherwise, electronic thermometers are direct read. Here's another example we was talking about that was in the other presentation. And we also talked about it not being practical to use one versus the other, use it for its intended purpose. And the error can be associated with the thermometer if it's used incorrectly. And so accurate temperature measure is the single most difficult measurement to obtain from a storage tank and is typically the greatest source of error. So temperature is very important. And it, that error is dependent upon the density. So if the density, if the temperature is error is significant, the density error would be significant. So be mindful that the temperature must be right. Measurement in that tank. Uh, again, use an ASTM approved certified thermometer. Before each use, uh, inspect the whole assembly, make sure the uh, mercury is not broken. Uh, don't, again, if it is broken uh, and you need to replace the thermometer, do not uh, be careful that it's a hazardous waste. Mercury is hazardous or has been deemed hazardous. Hazardous. Uh, so be careful there. Uh, wood back uh, cup case thermometers. Uh, are explained in great detail in chapter seven. Uh, there's a table in chapter seven that determines how often or how, how, how many times and at what level in the tank, depending on the volume in the tank, you need to take that temperature measurement, then you would average those together. So you may take three readings at near the bottom, three readings midway up, and three readings near the top, the surface to get a good average temperature of that tank. Uh, chapter five, I mean, chapter seven, table five notes where those measurements should be made at. Uh, typically, a wood back, we already discussed this. Uh, you want to read it to the nearest degree. A PET electronic thermometer reads in tenths of a degree. So, a little more accurate. Uh, uh, actually, I prefer electronic thermometers over the, uh, the uh, mercury type used in a wood back cup case assembly. Uh, they're quicker, they, uh, they stabilize quicker. Uh, they're easier, more, more uh, readily available uh, and quickly used. And so uh, it saves time and uh, in the long run, it's gonna save you money. And so here's an example of table five in the standard. Uh, if your level uh, is greater than 10 feet, which is probably always going to be the case you're going to deal with. You want to take three temperature measurements, middle of the upper level, middle and the lower thirds, and the middle lower thirds of that liquid. So typically you're going to be over 5,000 barrels, uh, most all, in all cases, and you want to take three different level measurements or three different temperature measurements in that tank at different levels. Uh, again, here's reiterating that. Uh, three test, three feet below the surface of the top of the liquid, the middle of the liquid, and three feet above the bottom of the liquids is the way I determine that. And when I gauge tanks, this is the rule of thumb I use. Also, with electronic thermometers and wood back cup case thermometers using mercury thermometers, glass thermometers, there is a time in which the thermometer must rest at those different areas in the tank. And so a perfect example of that, uh, are, are, uh, given the API standard, is these are the moments, seconds, that the temperature must remain at that spot 
dependent on the gravity. Okay, so when you use electron thermometer, for example, if the, your gravity is above 50 degrees API, you want to leave it at that, at that location for 30 seconds minimum. Always let, make sure the temperature stabilizes and does not change. Once you've got to the point where it doesn't change, given that you left it there for 30 seconds, then you've got your reading. And then when you're using a cupcake thermometer, a whole different ball game. Uh, if the liquid's in motion, you leave it five minutes. If it's stationary, you leave it 10 minutes. 10 minutes. This, this 10 minutes is violated way too often. All right. So you want to make sure that the gauger is taking his time to allow that temperature to stabilize for 10 minutes in a stationary tank where there's no motion. So refer to the standards and you'll know how long those temperatures have to remain there or those thermometers have to remain there to stabilize, a minimum. It may take longer than this, but the minimum is 10 minutes. Okay, there's one more additional temperature record we need to take. And uh, that's the, amb the amb ambient temperature of the tank shell. And so the steel uh, contracts, expands, and the calculation for that needs the temperature of the tanks, of the ambient temperature. So we want to record that temperature. So always record the ambient temperature. If the tank's insulated, then no ambient temperature correction or shell correction is required. So if it's just a steel tank, steel ship, we want to know what the ambient temperature is. And it's in the equation. So sampling. Now we've got to catch a sample. We've got a temperature. Now we need to grab a sample. The same thing applies here. You grab samples at different levels. And, uh, and the examples are given here is very simply, it's all based on how full the tank is. And therefore you want to reach, take a thief. Do I have an example of a thief? Yes, sorry. Here's the example of a sample thief. And here's the levels of which you must take the sample or the areas in which we need to take the sample. So here we got a sample taken in the upper area of the tank. Even if this is a ship, uh, the middle sample area and the lower sample area. And these are the devices we use to grab those samples. And so each sample is brought to the, to the uh, surface and poured in sample bottles that would then go back to the lab to be analyzed. So let's go back, make sure I didn't miss anything. Yeah, it's all based on the percent full of the tank percentage fill. So now that we've got our samples from each one of these locations, we will take those samples to the lab and we will pour these samples into one container and average them. So then we would mix that sample thoroughly and then we will grab our gravity. So, um, So it is recommended, oh, sorry. Mercy. Stand by. So one of the most important things you need to be aware, aware of on taking samples is to preserve the integrity of that sample. Once the cap is put on the sample bottle, tag it with the pertinent information about time, uh, date, uh, maybe the batch number of the tank uh, or the liquid in the tank, if, that's, if it's done by batch or by monthly ticket, you want to be able to put all the information you can on that sample tag so that it, that sample can be identified. And also you need to keep a, a spare or reserve sample just in case questions arise. So once you've Determine what your gravity is in that tank, and you take that sample 
and you set it aside for any future reference or if any questions arise. So you always want to keep a reference sample. At least uh, typically in, in, in the industry in which we deal with is 30 days. Here's a good example of what's on the tag. Especially the zone in which the sample was taken, make sure you note it, you mark that, that it was taken in the middle zone, upper zone, lower zone. Uh, again, the date and time. You just want to put pertinent information on that tag so no questions can be, or you cannot be challenged. If you're challenged, you want to be able to back up the data that you've captured in the tank. And then, like I said earlier, you would take equal portions of each sample and mix them together as a combine, to combine them as a composite sample for that tank. And then we must mix them thoroughly. Usually that's done with ultrasonic mixers uh, if they're in a sample bottle. Now we need to determine the gravity. And we're going to be using a thermal hydrometer to do this. Uh, make sure it is certified again. You don't want a hydrometer, thermal hydrometer is not certified. Again, you want to make sure this hydrometer is in good shape, the mercury has not separated in the thermometer. You want to make sure that the tape, that the uh, paper uh, scale inside the unit has not slipped or, or has uh, become uh, damaged in any way that is legible. So what you're going to do is you're going to take that sample you just mixed up. And you're going to pour that sample into a test cylinder. You're going to perform the test as quickly as possible while the sample is fresh. Once you uncap the sample bottle, use it immediately. Don't let it sit on the table for any extended period of time with the cap off of it. Uh, crude oil does weather. Uh, the uh, light ends want to weather off vaporize off, so therefore that uh, questions the integrity of that sample. Once you get that sample poured into your uh, test cylinder, you want to allow it to rest, get all the air bubbles out of it. You want to make sure that it becomes stable. It's not, not changing uh, level or height. You want to take that, that reading as quickly as possible because the longer you let it set, the temperature is changing based on the ambient temperature. For example, your sample could be at 60 and the room could be at 80 degrees. So therefore it almost immediately starts affecting your sample. And the sample cannot, or the test cannot be run if there's any bubbles in that liquid, in that sample test cylinder. Also, you wanna make sure that you're in a location where there's no air currents blowing that hydrometer around inside that test cylinder. So you wanna be in a very controlled environment um, and you want to read the, uh, once the thermometer stabilizes, temperature is stabilized, you want to read the gravity and the temperature. That's going to be your reserve gravity. We've already talked about uh, verifying the uh, thermometers in good shape. Uh, you want to lower that hydrometer gently into the sample. Do not allow the displacement of the liquid to uh, wet the stem overflow or and overflow the cylinder because now your sample is, is no good. You got to start all over. So what you want to do is you want to lower it, sample, lower it slowly so none of that liquid gets on the upper portion of the stem that's not going to be used. So you want it to lower it slowly enough so that you find buoyancy and not let it go too deep into the cylinder. Don't drop it in there. Don't push it down any significant depth. Just lower it slowly into there until it becomes buoyant. And that, let it rest there until it becomes stable. And then uh, stir it gently. By gently just rising and lowering the, the, the hydrometer, just, just a little, a couple of degrees API, just to make sure everything is free and that the reading is going to be accurate. Then we want to watch that temperature and make sure that temperature stops moving. Take, take your time, allow it to rest for at least 30, 45 seconds. And uh, just let it come to temperature, temp, before you make that reading. 
Make sure it's not touching any sides, it's kind of floating in the middle of the cylinder and that it's not clinging to anything. Maybe you want to spin it a little bit. Just give it a little spin. And that makes sure it's free floating. Okay. So you want to take your level reading now. You want to take your API reading, your gravity reading. And I demonstrated in the other slide that you read even with the bottom of the level, or the top of the level, I'm sorry. Not the top of the meniscus, but the level of the liquid across the scale. Have your eyes slightly below the level and raise and lower, lower your, your eye, your level, your head in a straight line to make sure you get a good reading on that gravity. Very similar to this. So everything is on the level. So raise your head, lower your head so you get a good straight reading on that liquid. And then you read the value. Again, we talked about the uh, Anton Parr, for example, digital GP, uh, API gravity determination. Again, that's an option for you. I would recommend this as the option. Okay, so you need to clearly document your test. Um, you wanna make sure that you record uh, the type of crude it is. If you designate your crude by a certain name or uh, nomenclature, uh, make sure you note that. Uh, the tank that it came out of or the tank that you took the sample from. Um, I'm sure on ships there's multiple tanks, uh, multiple chambers, so each one I'm sure has a number. Uh, the time the sample was taken, where the samples were taken, you know, what I mean by that is position the tank, top, middle, bottom, uh, test type, and test results. Record everything you can. So now that we give it all the neither, neither quantitative and qualitative data about the product in the tank, we can now enter this data into the measurement ticket. And so you want to write all this data down because this data is going to be used to determine your net volume. Okay, so again, we want to do these, these tests pretty quickly. Uh, we don't want ambient conditions to skew the results of our test. We want to make sure we get accurate temperature readings. We want to make sure we read that hydrometer correctly. And all these things are vitally important to determine the accurate net volume. Rest, take a break. You know, um, we're just about at the end, Henry. And I wanted, to, we've got about seven minutes left. I wanted to, um, we can, when you finish up your session on Wednesday, we'll have you start back off where we've left off here. I'm gonna ask you to move for your second. We'll have you go ahead and start back where um, where you've left off here and then go into the other chapters. I don't want to rush through. And if there's any questions tonight before we uh, before we proceed forward um, and end this session, if there's um, anything that uh, anybody had a question for uh, Henry before we, we, we break off. Um, but also, I, I kind of wanted to go over a little bit of what you're gonna see uh, both uh, a little bit this week and then as we get into next week uh, is you've seen a lot of manual processes that we're, we're doing to try to determine what the, um, what the level and what the volume of the uh, crude oil is inside of a ship. And also you've seen what it takes to go through and manually start uh, gauging a ship, pulling out the multi-level samples and going through and doing the sampling, the mixing of them, the recording and everything else. What we're gonna show you a little bit tomorrow and then into next week is how that process has been automated 
by using metering both on platform or in a production ship or as it's brought off. So we can automate some of this process, the process of the correction for temperature and gravity on the fluid as it's passing through. And also for uh, manually or for automatically having a system that is grabbing representative samples at a frequency as the fluid is passing by and grabbing these samples and putting them into sample pods that are mixed and then brought back to a lab for examination instead of having to make a, a manual process out of this. The other thing Henry um, went into a little bit about uh, this is, this is also a very dangerous task that we ask people to do to go in and manually gauge these tanks. I, I've always uh, done, thought of it like fishing, that I'm taking a fishing rod and trying to fish down in there. Well, the problem is in order for me to fish down in here, I have to open up a tank that now has hydrocarbon vapors coming out. And a lot of uh, areas in the US, it is now uh, the states and the government has, has made certain areas that it's illegal for uh, you to send a person up there without having uh, respirators, full respirators, air supplied respirators, because of the amount of sulfur and other contaminants that were coming off. And it was a very, it's a very dangerous thing to go in and, and manually gauge these tanks. Now, do this also in a ship in bad weather, and you can see the challenges that come across with this. So um, again, what we're gonna show you in, in the next uh, few days and, and into next week is how this process has also started to become over the years more automated and the accuracy of it. Now, the accuracy of, of hand gauging the tank can run anywhere from a quarter percent when everything is absolutely perfect up to a percent and a half, 2%, 3%, depending on who's taking it, the accuracy of the equipment, the calibration of the equipment. So we wanna to try to get to a custody quality transfer measurement where we're below 0.25%. And that's something that's certainly achievable by the equipment that we're gonna go over in, in the future. Um, but if we follow good practices and we follow good procedures, we're gonna be able to also reach that accuracy level um, as, as close as we can get. From a witnessing standpoint, these, these are all really important points that Henry has gone over that if we're witnessing a, uh, um, the measurement of tankage or we're looking at the documentation, there's an awful lot of points that we can come out and, and take a look at and, and take away from this. And uh, we'll provide more documentation, but as always, most of the documentation we're providing is straight out of the API manuals. The API manuals have been developed over decades to assist in, in custody transfer measurement. So please utilize them um, and, and we'll provide the links for uh, most of the documents out there so that you're able to see where you can go and purchase these documents. They are copyrighted, so a lot of them we're not able to provide. Um, you have to purchase them directly from API and or with some of the publishers out there. But are there any questions that uh, I can answer or Henry can answer before we sign off for tonight? Excellent. Well, so no So I just want to say that we're going to this this next part uh, summarizes all the stuff we've talked about to arrive at that volume, and so it's a good place to stop and it's a good place to start uh, in a couple of days, and we'll finish this up, and then I think we'll probably move on to like metering measurement and and uh, online determination what what we determined to be dynamic measurement. And we'll go into a lot of detail there as well. So you understand the options and the difference between the static measurement and, and dynamic measurement, uh, the pros and cons, um, how they complement each other in a lot of respects, uh, so on and so forth. 
So look forward to talking to you guys again. All right. Well, thank you. Hope everybody has a good day and we will see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.